It is good to be with you this morning as we gather for worship and as we come to God's Word and continuing in our Easter Tide series, Walking in Abundant Life. The joy that we have in knowing that Christ died and Christ rose in order that we might enjoy life and life in the full, life more abundantly as he promised us in John chapter 10. And as we explore that motif with greater detail, as we consider um, the fullness of the gospel of John and the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ, as he um, further defines that abundant life for us, in his word. This morning, our text is found in John chapter 16, verses 23 through 33, a little slightly different than uh, what I have printed uh, in the bulletin. And I put uh, the title, or the subtitle of our text in scare quotes or air quotes uh, for a reason, which I'll explain here in just a little bit. But if you have your Bibles, I do encourage you to open up to John chapter 16. And to find verse 23, and if you don't have your Bibles, please uh, take a pew Bible and turn with me. I'll invite you to stand now for the reading of God's Word. In that day, you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of in the Father's name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. That's a reference, I think, to the abundant life, the full life, the joyful life. I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you. Because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world. And now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. His disciples said, Ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Lord Jesus Christ, we do thank you for your word and the confidence that it inspires in us that you have overcome the world. And because you have done so, we can walk in and enjoy abundant life. Lord, pour out your life upon us, upon your church this morning. Grant us a greater measure of your Holy Spirit and understanding by your word in order that we might be your people, in order that we might walk truly an abundant life. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. As we begin this morning, I want to direct your attention to the screen as they turn the lights down. Something that I want to share with you this morning. It's called being a professional. And they're, and they're, they're going to do that. They're going to be a problem. That's part of the deal. Everyone here is going to be that. Now, if they don't do that, then that's coaches, players, management, anybody. If they don't do that, then they need to go somewhere else. That's unthinkable to me. That you have an opportunity in your lifetime to be a professional? That you think about quitting? See, you don't quit in, in, and you don't quit in sports. You retire. You don't get to quit. That's not an option. See, someone told me that a long time ago. That, that ain't even an option. 
And the person told me that, he ain't here anymore. He died. This is what's great about sports. This is what the greatest thing about sports is. You play to win the game. Hello? You play to win the game. You don't play to just play it. That's the great thing about sports. You play to win. And I don't care if you don't have any wins. You go play to win. When you start telling me it doesn't matter, then retire. Get out. Because it matters. This whole conversation bothers me. Big time. It really does. Because the one thing I know, <laughs> I don't quit. That will not happen. That, that will not happen. You play to win the game. Wisdom from Coach Herm Edwards, former uh, coach of the New York Giants, or excuse me, New York Jets football team. I share a little bit of that with you, of that larger press conference, to help frame our understanding and thinking about our text for this morning. As you know, we are considering what it means to walk in the abundant life. As I shared, the abundant life motif is uh, described and prescribed for us by the Lord Jesus Christ in John's Gospel, chapter 10, as Jesus is teaching about the Good Shepherd. And I shared with you a number of weeks ago that it was my belief that in that extended text in John chapter 10 that Jesus was naming the contours of the abundant Christian life. And that throughout this series, as we are working our way in Eastertide and remembering the, the purpose and the glory and the impact that the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ has on our lives, Jesus Christ dying and rising to new life in order that we might walk in his abundant life, I shared with you that those motifs were delineated further in John's gospel. And so... A number of weeks ago, we looked at what it meant to know Christ in a particular way out of John chapter 10. That is to see Christ, to perceive him, to remember that the, the world is, is chock full of the glory of God and God is out there. Christ is out there seen in 10,000 faces. He plays in 10,000 places seen on the contours of men's faces. We are called to see him and to perceive him, to see where he's working, see what he's inviting us into in order that we might enter into the fullness of the abundant life. Two weeks ago then, Rick took that theme of knowing Christ and opened it up more as I shared with you that the reference to knowing Christ that Jesus is talking about in John chapter 10, there are two different words. One has to do with perceiving Christ at work in the world, and the other has to do with knowing the Father. And Jesus said, this is eternal life, that they might know you, Father, as I know you. And as we know the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ, we get to walk in abundant life, which leads us to an eternal life in heaven, the new heavens and the new earth. Last week we considered... The fruitful life, this image of the pasture in John chapter 10. God is calling us to enter through the door in order that we might enjoy the bounty and the fullness of the fruitful life, which Jesus further delineates and explains through his teaching on the vine and being connected to the vine in order that we might be fruitful. This morning, as I was looking at our text, both John chapter uh, 16 as well as our text from John chapter 10, considering the work of the shepherd and what the shepherd does to protect us from the wolves that are seeking to devour, to steal, and to kill, there is a protective element that we enjoy 
as we walk with Christ and as we enter into and walk in the abundant life, Christ's purposes for us is to protect us. But as I was reading our text in John chapter 16, verses 23 through 33, I came to see that I only had really half of the equation. The abundant life is not just about or even primarily about protection, the protected life. As I was reading through the text and praying about it, all I could hear was Herm Edwards, you play to win the game. I came to a different conclusion after studying studying the text. Our text for this morning John 16, 23 through 33, in this theme of the abundant life, is not so much about protection as it is about victory. It includes protection. But protection taken up in the victory of the Lord Jesus Christ and the purposes of victory that Christ has for us as we walk with him. In this world, Jesus says, you will have tribulation. It's a fight. It's difficult. It's a challenge. But take heart. I have overcome the world. This idea of overcoming the world does have a defensive idea to it, a defensive motif in which Jesus is in the world and in our lives by the power of the Holy Spirit to protect us, to defend us. But it is more than that. Jesus is in the world and in us by the power of the Holy Spirit to invite us to walk in abundance and in the abundant life in order that we might engage not just in a defensive posture, but in an offensive posture. God wants us to walk in a measure of victory, victory over the world. Now, I want to suggest to you that we have to be careful with this motif within the church and within church history. There has been an overemphasis of a theology known as uh, Christus Victor, Christ the Victor. And that we as Christians can walk almost arrogantly And thinking about ourselves as winners, victorious. And I think that that is a a concern in which you enter into one side of the ditch. But that's not the ditch I think we find ourselves in right now. If we're trying to be on the crown of the road, the middle of the road, we're on the other side of the ditch in which we don't believe we can win. But you play to win the game. I have overcome the world. Jesus plays to win the game. In fact, he has won the game. And these are the rules of the game. Let me share them with you. If you die for the sins of the world and you come back to life, then you win the world. That's the rules of the game. If you die for the sins of the world and you come back to life, you win the world and you win life itself. You are the king. You are the master of life and death. The world is yours and the power of life is yours. And Christ is one. Death is dead. Jesus is victorious. And so the abundant life is not so much about protection, or at least what I assumed as I was preparing this series a number of weeks ago, as much as it is about victory. You play to win the game. So I want to suggest to you this morning as we consider our text, the big idea, the abundant life includes, it must include, a holy desire to win the game. To be a part of the church. To be a part of the kingdom of God. 
to be a part of Christ and a member of Christ, we must have, if we are walking in the abundant life, a desire to win the game. But I believe that the holy desire to win the game has been both misplaced and displaced within the larger church. It has been displaced by a belief that victory is not a faithful conception of the abundant Christian life. Victory might be a a conception of abundant life in general. Victory might be something that we want to hold on to and achieve if we're a member of a team, if we're uh, a member of a, of a, work, uh, a workforce or a company. It might be something that we want to believe in and hold to as a community. But victory isn't something that we entertain and understand as part of the abundant Christian life. It's been displaced by the conception that competition, battle, and victory belong to the world. not to the church. The problem with displacement of the concept of victory and winning is that the human being, you and I, by nature, we have in us a desire to win. It's not a function of the fall. It's a function of what it means to be a human being. We have a desire to win. It's like Jeremiah who said, it's in my bones like a fire and I cannot deny it. And if we deny the desire to win, we're less than human. We're less than what God has called us to be. We might not always desire the right game. Perhaps we're not playing the right game, but that doesn't mean that we don't have within us a desire to win. And so when the church has no conception of winning, we lose. When the church has no conception of winning, it loses. It loses to the arenas that are everywhere. It loses to the fields. It loses to the ice rinks. It loses to the gymnasiums and the clubs and the youth organizations and the colleges and the markets and the marketplaces. And we lose our people to competition because we have no conception of winning. We don't play to win the game. And so we lose. Eric Miller, professor of history at Geneva College, quite an insightful person, came and taught a Sunday school class here a number of years ago, free at last. Some of you may have remembered it. It was a uh, Sunday school adult Christian education class on freedom. It was tremendous. I had an opportunity to spend some time with Professor Miller, uh, took him out to lunch, had a wonderful uh, opportunity and occasion to get to know him. I believe he's a man of God and someone who has a keen insight and perception to some of these things. He's written quite a bit on sports, actually. And in 2007, following the 2006 Pittsburgh Steelers Super Bowl championship, he wrote an article for Christianity Today, which he entitled, Why We Love Football. He was speaking not only as a nation, but particularly of Pittsburgh Steeler fans. Let me share with you just a brief excerpt of what he had to say. Professor Miller writes, Pittsburghers love the team. Is that right? Sure we do. Pittsburghers love the team, and in loving, they gain a taste for life. Or better, a rich sampling of a deeper, truer life. In a faith-starved world, in a land being slowly emptied of meaningful ritual 
and intimate human ties. They, like modern folk the world round, turn to sports as a means of participation in friendship, laughter, play, and joy. And to that, I would add a desire to win. All of these things that lay at the heart of any healthy and flourishing human world, a place of which God can say, it is good. But football, for all the good it may bring to a people and a place, is not the final good. To the starving, a piece of bread looks like a meal. The healthy know that it is not. That we in our deepest parts hunger and thirst for something more. And that if this hunger isn't augmented by more nutritious fare, the suffering will in some form go on. Much more is needed for true health. If the hunger is not satisfied, Folks will go elsewhere so that they can be fed. True health is, of course, the abundant Christian life where friendship, joy, peace, and a conception of winning is found. And it is found not only in the abundant Christian life, it must be found and kept and stewarded within the church. I believe the church needs to recover a holy and sanctified imagination for winning. We need to play to win the game. Because if we don't and can't play to win the game, our players will go elsewhere. They will have to. There will be an insatiable need to go somewhere else. And there's a difference between playing to win and playing not to lose. They're not the same thing. Perhaps there are some who will say within the Christian faith and within the church, all right, we'll play, but let's play not to lose. I'm not satisfied with that. And I don't think Christ is satisfied with that. Playing not to lose is not a part of the abundant Christian life. I believe a Christian's imagination for winning has been misplaced by a false gospel of niceness and politeness as we play not to lose. This false gospel of niceness says everyone's a winner, no losers. We've seen it on other church billboard signs. There was a book that sold quite a bit. Love wins. Everybody wins. Let's be polite. Let's be nice. There's no need for competition. No need for excellence. No need to distinguish the weak from the strong. No need to reward those who diligently seek Christ. Everybody gets a participation trophy. That is a losing strategy. And you play to win the game. Sam Shoemaker. He was rector of Calvary Episcopal Church in Pittsburgh. Someone of some notoriety and fame. Helped to start AA. He once famously said that it was his desire to make Pittsburgh as famous for God as it is for steel. It's a tremendous vision. It's a tremendous statement. I full, fully and wholeheartedly agree and join my desire with Sam Shoemaker that Pittsburgh be as famous for God as it is for steel. But I fear that today we don't really want Jesus to be famous for winning. Winning our city. Winning in public spaces. 
As much as we'd like him to be famous because he's nice, because he's polite, because he has a nice and good reputation within our city. We want Jesus to politely get along with all the other teams who are playing in the city. To politely and nicely get along with the schools. To politely and nicely get along with the governments, local and state and otherwise. To nicely and politely play along with the other competing organizations who are all playing to win. That's what we want Jesus to be famous for. We won't allow Jesus to play to win. But Jesus says, I've won. I have overcome the world. I have victory. Jesus says, no. I can't do that. I won't do that. The abundant life is not polite. It's not nice. It's not deferential. The abundant Christian life must be and is characterized by dominion. Not politeness, politeness, not niceness. Dominion. Overcoming the world through Jesus Christ. I want to share with you a little bit about dominion. As we read in Psalm chapter 8, it is our destiny. I have made you a little lower than the angels that you might have dominion in the world. And Christ says, I have overcome the world in order that you might walk in the abundant Christian life and exercise dominion. Now before I define for you what dominion is, let me share with you a little bit about what it is not so that we are not confused. Dominion is not total annihilation. Whereby we see the others who are playing the game as the enemy to be defeated at all costs. Whereby we assert ourselves and exert our strength and power so that we might annihilate them. There's no sportsmanship, was there? We all felt it when the New England Patriots ran up the score to 70 points as they totally annihilated the other team. You play to win the game. You don't play to annihilate everyone. Dominion is not annihilation. Dominion is not plundering. Taking all of the resources that can be found on the playing field and keeping them just for ourselves. That is not dominion. That is not the call of God upon our life. That is not what it means to walk in the abundant Christian life. It's not annihilation. It's not plundering. And it's not dominance. Bending the other to our will in order that we might control them. To the extent that we entertain or even engage slightly in any of these things, we have left the Christian dominion mandate. We are not walking with Christ. We are walking with the world. This is the world's definition of dominion. It is not Christ's. A biblical Christian dominion is characterized by three things. Not annihilation, not plundering, not dominance, but by these three things. First, seeing the good. To have dominion, we must have vision. We have to see. We have to be able to see what's going on on the field. They talk about this with quarterbacks all the time. The game has to slow down. You have to be able to see the plays develop. You have to have that sixth sense about how things are going. If we are going to have dominion, we have to see the good. See, God has made the world in a particular way, and he has a purpose for it. And Christ died so that the church could capture a vision for the world. And Christ's vision for the world is the world restored in all of its glory and goodness back to God. That is the vision. And to have dominion, we must see the good. We must love the good. We must hold on to the good that God has established for us. 
if we do not grasp it with all of our might, you can't win. You play to win the game. And so you must, we must, because Christ is inviting us into it, and he's died in order that the grace of God might be poured out into our lives so that we can do it, we are called to embrace the good. Seeing the good in order that we might secondly have dominion in developing the good. God wants the church to develop the world and to refine the stuff of the earth in accord with his purposes and his plans. First you have to see it, and that's That's an important first step, not to be overlooked. Do you have an adequate vision? Do we understand God's plan and purpose and vision for the world? Once we see it, then we are charged to do something about it. To develop it. To build things. To grow things. To expand as the church and to see Christ's kingdom advance. Always taking the field and playing to win the game. Third, you see the good, you develop the good. To have dominion then is to gather strength for the good. If we are going to play to win, then we must develop skills, strength, excellencies, virtues, which is why we're talking about virtues in our Sunday school class. In order to decisively win the game, We must have strength. There's conditioning. Got to get in shape. Because you play to win the game. This is dominion. And Jesus tells us how a Christian receives holy dominion as part of the abundant Christian life in our text for this morning. You want to have dominion? Jesus says. You want to win the game? First, you need to be on the team. Are you on the team? As my brother Tom O'Boyle has said, I love the way he shared this early on when he came to the staff. He said, you're either in the boat or out of the boat, right? As he was on the rowing team in college. And the coach said to him, O'Boyle, you're either in the boat or you're out of the boat. And he said, I'm out of the boat. That was good. He had a vision. He could see it. But if we bear Christ's name, you're either in the boat or you're out of the boat. You have to be on the team. Behold, the hour is coming, Jesus said. Verse 32. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered. Not in the scattered dimension as we talk about it here at Beverly Heights Church. as the church scattered out as the salt, light, and leaven of the kingdom of God. What Christ is warning us of is that you will be scattered off the team. You'll walk off the team. The hour is coming when you will be scattered each to his own home, and you will leave me alone. You're off the team. You want to win? You want to have dominion? You have to be on the team. You have to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the coach. He's the owner. And he's inviting us to play. And we have to ask ourselves, am I on the team or am I off the team? And if I'm on the team, then am I doing the things that are consistent with being on the team? Am I playing to win the game? Jesus says you need to be on the team. Second of all, verse 33 We need to run the plays that God has in his playbook. And the play that he's called is peace. I have said these things to you, verse 33, that you may have peace. Coach, what play are we running? Peace. Run the peace play. And what does Jesus mean by peace? So often our conception of peace is the absence of conflict. Just everybody get along with each other. That's the gospel of niceness. Just everybody, just be nice. Let's not have any conflict. But that's not shalom. That's not biblical peace. Biblical peace isn't the absence of conflict. It is the presence 
of the whole. It is all the parts, all the pieces, working in perfect harmony in order to accomplish the goal. It is all the players on the team, united and working toward a common goal in order that the world might be healed. Run the play called peace. And then thirdly, you have to have the heart of a champion. you got to be on the team. we got to run Christ's play. And we are called to have the heart of a champion. In this world, you will have tribulation. You will have trouble. But what does Jesus say after that? But take heart. Take heart. And so we're in the game. It's gut check time. And Christ is asking, do you want to win the game? This is what it means to have dominion. But let's also then define the win. It's one thing to say that we're called to win the game, that we play to win the game. But what does winning look like? I'll suggest to you a few things. Winning, not as an individual. Because being a Christian isn't just me and Jesus. It's me on the team. So I'm not talking about individual wins. It's a team sport. And I'm not necessarily talking about a national win, but a win for a team that represents their city. What does a win look like? What is a win for a church that represents the South Hills of Pittsburgh? number of things. First, the church is winning when it's central in the city. You know that you're winning when they throw a parade for you downtown. We saw that when the Steelers won the Super Bowl. We saw that when the Penguins won the Stanley Cup. I don't remember it, but I'm told years and years ago when the Pirates used to win that we had a parade for them. Nobody's going to throw a ticker tape parade for the church. I understand that. But there was a time when the church was the center of every community. You went downtown, you went to the center square, and what did you find? The church. The church isn't in the center anymore because we don't play to win the game. We abdicate that space and we let other players take it. Winning looks like influence. It looks like outsiders becoming attracted to our team. There's such a thing as Steeler Nation. You know that? You can find a Steeler bar anywhere in the world. If you want to watch the Steelers on Sunday, you can do it because Steeler Nation is strong. There is influence and attraction. The church is winning when Christians influence others as we bear witness as the church when we are scattered into the world and people see that we're winners. And we have a desire and a thirst to win. And they have an attraction to it. They have interest in it. You know that you're winning. The church is winning when there are conversions. You might call them first down conversions. We're winning when we recruit new players to the team. It's nice and I appreciate it when we trade with other churches for players. I enjoy that. It's not bad. But I want to win. And so we are called to conversion. Making the conversion. And yes, there's a responsibility laid upon us to bear witness to the Lord Jesus Christ and to bring those who are in darkness into the church. And we're all called to be witnesses. We might not all be evangelists, but we're all called to bear witness. We're all called to speak a word of the gospel in word and in deed to our neighbor. But that matters nothing if we're not converting in here. If we're losing our kids... If we're losing the next generation of players who will win. Winning looks like obedience. You're winning when the team believes and buys into the program. I just went and watched with my kids just two weeks ago. The Disney movie Miracle. 
the 1980 USA hockey team. Hudson's like, yeah. He's a hockey player. You know what I'm talking about. Coach Herb Brooks, who's pulling together a team to, to compete with the greatest hockey team ever to, to step onto the ice, the Russian hockey team. Older, mature, seasoned, professional hockey players who have played with each other for years, dominated the sports for 20 years. And Herb Brooks said, we're going to win. And he gathered together a bunch of kids from colleges. But they would all come and he would ask, what's your name? And he'd give the name. They'd give their name. Who do you play for? And they'd always reference the college that they came from. And then they were playing a tune-up game, a preliminary game against Finland. They got beat terribly. And all Herb Brooks could hear were the the players talking about all the girls they could see in the stand and what they were going to do that night. And so when the game was over, they were skating off of the ice in order to go get ready for their hot dates. And Herb Brooks said, get back on the ice. And they ran drills for hours. They skated back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And as they were skating, as they were puking their guts out, Herb Brooks would ask, what's your name? Who do you play for? What's your name? Who do you play for? And finally, it sunk in as the captain of the team, Rizzo. My name's Rizzo, and I play for the United States of America. And Herb Brooks said, gentlemen, we're done. What's your name? Christian. Who do you play for? The church of Jesus Christ. You know that you're winning when you face opposition. You know you're winning when you start to face stronger opponents. You're winning when the stronger opponents want to match you. Perhaps it's been too easy. Perhaps we're not facing harder giants on the field because we're not playing to win the game. You know that you're winning when you enjoy glory. The Steelers are respected because they're a dynasty. There's a sense of awe. There's a sense of wonder. There's a sense of respect for the sustained goodness of the team, the players, the coaches, the owners. There's glory. Is there glory in the church? As we prepare to go out of the world to win, I want to share this with you. Do not despair. These are the best days and the best conditions for our team to win. These aren't the worst days. These aren't the most difficult days. These are the best days to win. These are the greatest days to be alive. And we are not called to lose because Jesus Christ has won. Therefore, we are not permitted to despair. I have overcome the world. We are not permitted to despair despite what we read in the news, despite a global pandemic, despite food shortages. And the inability to get formula for our children, despite the the predictions, the economic predictions that we are on our way to stagflation. We haven't seen that in 50, 60 years. Despite the fact that I just read this week that Willow Creek, one of the largest churches in the United States of America, is this week laying off 30% of their staff. Despite the fact that I just read this week that Gordon Conwell Seminary is selling off its 102 acre campus in Hamilton, Massachusetts, because of sustained lack of enrollment. Nobody's coming, nobody's training, nobody's preparing to be pastors for the future. Seminary that was connected with Billy Graham, where our own Pastor Emeritus graduated, selling off 102 acres. Nevertheless, We are not permitted to despair. You play to win the game. 
Despair is not a Christian habit of mind. Winning is. I believe the opportunities are ripe for dominion. Opportunities to win for the first time in 70 years. Roe v. Wade is on the ropes. We're winning with families. We're winning the moral fight. We're winning as Christian education alternatives to public education are developing exponentially. We're winning when eight kids in our kindergarten program heard the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and said the sinner's prayer and accepted the Lord Jesus Christ into their heart and into their lives for the very first time. We're winning. We're winning as we engage in new media opportunities to share the gospel and the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ as our podcast has been heard 27,000 times in 60 countries over three years. Perhaps the most effective mission engagement that this church has ever had. I know you all love the podcast, but you're not listening it to the tune of 27,000 times. People are hearing the gospel. These are the days to win. I believe the opportunities for winning are all around us. And I firmly believe we can win. Because Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation. But take heart. I have overcome the world. You play to win the game. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you are our coach. We want to play for you in such a way that brings you glory and praise and honor and advances your kingdom. Protect us, Lord, from pride and arrogance, but instill in us a new and healthy and sanctified imagination for what it means to win, for what it means to be the church on mission, for what it means to see the kingdom of God advance from this place, for what it means to be a Christian, for what it means to serve you in such a way and to develop the habits and the practices and the skills in order that we might excel, in order that we might win the game. Lord, we can't do it on our own. We acknowledge that immediately. But in you and through you, we can be what you've called us to be. Help us, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.